Hey, Overland Travel Adventures. Today we have a really special day. We're gonna go do the Land Rover Experience over at the Quail Lodge in Carmel Valley, California. This is really cool. Land Rover Corporate has set up these special places where you can go and drive any Land Rover and go out with a very good instructor. Phil is gonna be our instructor today. Uh, and we're signed up, so we're gonna go do that. So come along for the ride, should be a good time. So we concentrate on getting from point A to point B without doing any damage with expedition style driving. We're not intense rock crawlers here and we're not desert racers. We wanna get our vehicle back in good shape. Okay, so I'm gonna just secure the car before we get out. And the way we do that is the first thing we do is leave it in the gear we came in, set our parking brake, put the transmission in neutral, take our foot off the foot brake, back on the foot brake and put it in park. So then we're secure and there's no stress or strain on the transmission from either the engine or the weight of the vehicle. So the main thing we're gonna be concerned about when we go off road is the aluminum, the steel wheels. We don't wanna do any damage to that. So we're going to be concerned with three major angles of any vehicle. The first one up front we call the approach angle because we're approaching a hillside or a rock or a log. To de determine that angle, we find the contact patch of the tire where the tire touches the ground. And if you make, if you take an imaginary line from that point to the furthest forward, lowest part of the vehicle, mm -hmm. kind of like shoving a big piece of plywood into the tire, lifting it up, it's gonna stop someplace. Well, the edge of that plywood and the ground form an angle. That's our approach angle. Anything we can go that's inside that angle, we can go over without doing any damage to the bumper, the steering gear, any of the A-arms underneath. Second angle is in the center of the vehicle between the two axles. Pick a point approximately between the two axles. Lowest part of the vehicle. Draw that imaginary line from the contact patch of the front tire up to that lowest point in the middle between the two axles back down to the contact patch of the rear tire, and with the ground, that, those two lines form a squatty little pyramid. That's our approach angle. If you draw that line up to the bottom of the car here, anything inside that angle? Breakover, breakover angle. That's right. <laughs> approach, breakover. That's right. Yeah, I, I miss it sometimes. That's okay. As long as I don't get hit with a rock. Because anything we go over in the front, we're gonna, it's gonna end up back here. So we wanna make sure we don't do any damage to the plastic. Last angle is in the back of the vehicle. We call it the departure angle because we're leaving that hillside or we're coming out of a hole or dropping off of a log or a rock. Similar, you take that contact patch of the rear tire, draw that imaginary line to the furthest rearward, lowest part of the vehicle. It may not necessarily be the bumper with this hitch. It could be this hitch, or it actually could be something That's underneath, fair. like a tailpipe or something. Yeah. So we want to make sure we don't drag that like you see some of these uh, motor homes that pull up into a driveway. And they, yeah. yeah, they don't have a very good departure angle. So Phil, on the inside, it has on the four wheel drive information, it will tell your different departure breakover and- uh, You can go into the information screen and do that. How accurate is that, do you think? Uh, well, the, the angles have been determined at the factory. Right, so if you've modified don't or- pay it, Don't okay. pay attention to that, you get out and look. You either have a spotter, if you think you're going over something and you don't think you're gonna clear, you have sure. a spotter. You get out and pile rocks, pile logs, right. do what you have to do. It's a more practical exercise than it is technological. Now, we got a lot of technology in these vehicles and they're really cool. They, they do a lot of fun stuff. And a lot of drivers that haven't driven off road as much as you have tend to drive from their shoulders forward. That means they're sitting in their driver's seat and all they're paying attention to is they don't want to hit the stop sign. They don't want to hit the corner of the garage door. They want to get in. Everything behind them, they think, has been engineered properly. They don't have to worry about it. Off-road, we have to worry about the other $45,000 worth of car behind our shoulders, right? <laughs> we don't want to do any damage to that. Now, once we raise the electronic air suspension, we also have to worry about the roof because it goes up the same four and three quarters, almost five inches. We don't want to drive underneath a tree like this and leave the top hanging on the tree. We want to bring it back home with everybody inside. 
So the way I like to do it, because I don't uh, want to stick my head out the window and crane my neck looking for a tree that may hit the back of the vehicle, I take my mirrors and I adjust them. Once I've adjusted my, uh, my seating, I bring my mirror down and to the inside so I can see the widest part of the vehicle, approximately right here, the 12 o'clock <laughs> position on this wheel well. The most ground working. clearance we have is right down the center of the vehicle, which means if we have to go over a rock or go over a log or something, that's near the center of the trail, hmm. we want to straddle it or put it right down the center of the hmm. vehicle. It's different from a Jeep with the straight out. It's hanging down, yeah. yeah. You got that big uh, gear pumpkin. Now, if there's a rock though, near the edge of the trail, and we can't, we don't want to go drive off the trail to miss the rock, we're going to put a tread right on top of that rock. The tread's the strongest part of the tire. Of course, the sidewalls inside and outside are the weakest part. And we've only got a short time today. I don't want to be changing tires. So we're going to concentrate on some of the interior stuff, but mainly techniques. Okay. How much uh, you say you haven't had that vehicle off, but you've Gee. sounded like you had a lot of other experience yeah. off-road. Yeah. So we're just going to do a, a, a quick drive to talk about the techniques that I'd like you to try, because you may be doing different techniques than we do. If you have ideas that I don't know about, I'm always willing to listen because I always like to learn new techniques from other people okay um, but try it the way that we do it yeah and so see here. if you can incorporate <laughs> that into your uh toolbox yeah, so yeah. to speak yeah cool um, we think there's about 115 120 acres oh, okay. in, the, in the whole place we have about 12 miles of trail up here in the hills oh wow the rest of it is uh the, the club the golf course and some a lot of the homes that are on the property once i've in low range you you've had some the time with your encore specialist. Yep. Okay, so you're familiar with all the terrain response modes. But you wanted to know some things about how they react or how they optimize uh, for drivability in a particular terrain. You mentioned sand in particular. If the terrain response is set to sand, because the the engineers have designed the quote. I, I don't like. I'm not good with computers, so I just call it the thinkalator. When the thinkalator says to um, all the systems, well, Phil doesn't know how to drive in the sand, so I'm going to help him, but at least he's punched up my, my sand mode. So what it's going to do is it's going to start you off in second gear because it needs, you need to start off slower so that you don't bury yourself in the stand by spinning your wheels. If you were in first gear in low range, you've got a lot of torque, a lot of power coming back to those wheels. So you want to start off slower so you have some time to get floating on top of the sand. So it starts you in second gear. The other really good thing it does, besides optimizing all of the systems, is it extends the shift point between that second gear and third gear. Huh. So instead of shifting at a normal space and time, it extends that both in time and distance so that it gives you time to get that vehicle moving, pick up some momentum, and get floating on top of the sand. Now. That's what you need in driving in sand is momentum. You don't want to slow down. You don't want to, uh, well, there's a lot of things you don't want to do because of the terrain. You don't want to get stuck in the sand, but that's a whole other way of driving. Huh. Um, but if you're from, are you familiar? Did you go through all of the modes from general to grass, gravel, and snow? Mm -hmm. Slippery surfaces, but hard pack underneath. Mud and ruts, slippery surfaces, but no hard pack underneath. Sand mode, I just talked about that, and rock crawl. Okay. Rock crawl desensitizes the throttle, which is the main thing about it that I like. Besides optimizing all of the other systems, whether it's suspension or steering or throttle mapping, it desensitizes the throttle. So you have to physically push further down on the throttle before the vehicle accelerates. Mm -hmm. If you're in a tight situation, you don't want to step on it and leap right. forward and send your car to the body shop. Okay, so we're in we're in just some leaves and hard pack dirt. So what what train mode would you put in? I go in mud and ruts. Okay, because there's that no big rocks. Or preloads, anything. yeah. There's no big rocks. Uh, there's no big resistance against the front of the car, um, but you want a, a little more aggressive use of the uh, throttle and uh, preloading on the uh, lockers. And uh, that way that you never know what's going to come up and then you're, you're there. Now, because there is an automatic section to this, side to this, um, I haven't talked to the engineers about this, but my practical experience is 
if you put it, keep it in the auto mode, auto is where if the vehicle is driving on the highway and then you say, let's go see George's cabin up in the woods and you just pull off the driveway. There are a lot of sensors in the vehicle that will start picking up information, whether it's from the steering, throttle mapping or suspension. And it sends that information to the thinkalator. The thinkalator then says, I better optimize, I'm in dirt and it will change to whatever is the best situation, best mode for that. The problem with that is it's reactive. Correct. Yeah. Whereas I prefer to be proactive. Right. So I like to put it in the manual condition because if I'm driving up and I see a, a, a dry wash up there, I know there's going to be sand in the bottom. Before I get stuck in the sand, I mean, it changes pretty quick. I don't know the exact milliseconds that it changes but if i'm in the sand before the sensors pick up the information and send it to the thinker later thinker later sends it to the you know and you're stuck so i set that to sand before i get to the sand okay, gotcha. okay so i'm going to set my mirrors so i'm going to bring them down and i'm going to bring them to the inside so that i can see the widest part of the vehicle by just glancing over i want to keep my head normally so i can see the trail and I can see where the rock would be if it's going to be now down near the wheel. And I'm going to do that to the same on the right side. I'm going to bring that mirror to the inside, lower it down so I can see that widest part. This is the fender flare, about 12 o'clock on the, on the arc of the wheel. Well, I love this tip. I would have never done that. Oh, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's great because now... That makes complete sense, but I wouldn't... <laughs> this is why what we're I here. like is I like driver assist. If you're have to spot yourself and you're on windy roads and you've got rocks and logs, it's bad weather, you're driving with a buddy, he doesn't want to get out in that weather and spot you, and you want to spot yourself going down a narrow road or a trail with rocks and logs and turns, you punch up driver assist and those cameras underneath each of the mirrors and the two cameras in the front bumper, now if I come close to a log here, I can watch my tire as it turns out toward that log and I can just miss that log and I'm spotting myself. Right. And same thing on the left side. I can see if my wheel is turning out close to the edge of the trail, a rock, a log, whatever's gonna do me damage. And of course I can always see in the front, which is nice. But now the way I like to drive is I like to drive two-footed. You drive two-footed? No. Nope. Okay. Oh, right. oh, I guess off-road, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, drive with your left foot over the brake because if you've got your foot on the throttle and you're moving forward, but you want to slow down, it's quicker to slow down with your left foot while you still can maintain power if you want to with your right foot. So here I want to go between these two trees. I want to give myself extra space on both sides of the tree or approximately the same spacing on both sides of my vehicle. In case in California here, we have an earthquake. I may bounce one side or the other. So as I as I scan the trail ahead of me, I start looking for problems that'll keep me out of the body shop or put me in it. I see an overhanging tree up here. I think the, the most basic technique I like to teach out here, and it's the simplest, but it's the most important, is that if you don't want to hit it, stay away from it. <laughs> exactly. Simple as that. So I don't want to hit that roof, my roof on the top of that tree, so I pull to the right side of the trail. Now, I don't want to go off the trail, but I want to give myself as much room as possible between that tree and the roof of my car. But I saw a hole on the other side of this root in the middle of the trail from this tree here. So I know that when I'm past this tree, when I'm not going to hit it, I don't want my front wheel to drop in and do damage to my ramp breakover angle. So I pull away from that hole and I only go to the edge of the trail so I don't go off the trail. When I come back onto the trail, my front wheel has missed that hole but my back wheel is coming closer to that hole than my front wheel did. That's every time yep. you make a turn, you know that it's gonna come closer to the object you're turning around on the side that you're turning to. It'll go in that hole, it just won't go as deep. So I still go slow. The slower I go, the less compression of the suspension happens and the less likely I'm to compress it to the point of doing damage. Overhanging tree, stay to the right. Another tree, my lights help me see how far it is away from me. No problem. Okay, now we like to drive as slow as possible, as fast as necessary, yep. right? 
know that. So I can make plenty of good decisions. I have time to make good judgments as to where to place the car on the trail. Right now I see a right turn, tree on the right corner. I place my vehicle on the left side of the trail. Here, I want to maintain as much room as I can between that tree and my right rear corner. So since the hood's now obscuring the trail, I've looked ahead and kind of memorized where that trail is. So I can go further before I make the right turn. And of course, I'm, I didn't go through it with you, but I, I suspect you know how to do the shuffle control of the steering yep. from one hand to the other. So we don't cross our hands over. It's just one hand to the other for a number of reasons that if you Break need to know about that, we can talk about it later. Um, so here's another tree on my left with a turning trail to the left. I look at it until I pass it. Now I can just glance in my mirror, make sure I don't do any damage to the left rear corner. Um, I think I'll turn left up here, which means that tree is my nemesis. So I'm going to go close to these three trees, right? If I don't want to hit it, stay away from it. Now, up here, where I have to maintain power with my right foot, I want to slow myself down so I don't do damage on the left side of the vehicle. So I can keep my left foot on the brake while maintaining power up the hill. Now, as close as I am to this tree is gives me more room on the left side to make that left turn. Now, I don't want to make a right turn in this position. No. <laughs> so I'm going to turn left. You were like less than an inch from that tree. So now, well, <laughs> as long as I don't hit it, I'm fine. Now, if I continue, now I turn the wheel to stay away from that tree. If I continue with my wheel in this position, I'm going to come closer to that tree with my back left fender. I don't want to do that. So I straighten out my wheel. I want to make sure that I can see that information. So I can see that wheel up here and I can see they're straight. So I keep going straight until that tree gets to about my shoulder. Then I wanna make this quick, quick turn because I don't wanna get caught behind that tree. So I make a quick turn, but I move the vehicle slow. That way I save a lot of distance between the front of my vehicle and that tree. Glance in my mirror for that left tree, no sweat, clear that, gonna clear this. I'm a happy camper with this turn. Now. Last week, two weeks ago, this was full of water. It's still wet, mucky, and slippery. So I'm going to line my vehicle up so I can go into the hole, come out of the hole onto the center of the trail without turning my steering wheel. If I'm turning the steering wheel side to side as it's rolling forward, I've almost doubled my chances of losing traction. So I'm gonna keep it slow, keep the steering wheel straight, because if I aimed it toward those rocks and came down here and said, oh, I better move, it's too late. I turn the wheels, try to climb out, could make traction and slide back. Now, as long as my hood is climbing here, I don't have to worry about it touching. My departure angle, I think about when I get down to the bottom, if I started scraping here, I couldn't back up and change my angle. But if I drive slow and I go forward slow, I do a lot less damage underneath than if I drive fast. So have Again, you- Again, you're letting that suspension have time to react. Right? That's correct. Adjust. Now, have you used your hill descent control before? I, on my Jeep, I have, but oh, not on okay. the Land Rover. So you know how sure it, works it works with Land Rover? Put it on and take your foot off the brake and it brakes for you? Yeah. Well, it monitors the speed of the wheels. Okay. It doesn't, it, and, it, and by using the, the ABS braking system, yes. There are speed sensors on all four wheels and they work independent of one another. There's no way that we can operate a front right brake only. Hill descent control can do that for us. If we step on the brake, possibility that we may slide because we're braking all four brakes. If we lose traction, we lose control. If we lose control of the vehicle, Jackson, who takes over? Um. Gravity takes over. <laughs> Gravity never loses. <laughs> so we wanna make sure we have good control of our steering by keeping our hands approximately 10 and two and we shuffle the wheel, always have contact with the wheel with at least one hand or the other. The ground is always gonna to wanna to try to take the steering away from the driver. So to go downhill, I wanna go down slow. So I wanna go down in first gear manual. So I'm in drive now and I can see that. So I just push the, you know, you know how to do that. Yep. Go back in, they call it sport mode. It's, it's a good sales term. It's just the manual side of the transmission. I'm in first gear manual. I look and make sure and verify that my low range is still engaged. My hill descent control is engaged and ready to go. So it's not on here, is that just? And I don't know why. But it's on. 
No. Because you're getting, well, it, now you're it's getting on, it there. On the but back. it's not on there. So that's a, a light bulb or something. So now what I'm looking at is I'm making sure that the little arrow on the green arc is at its very bottom. That's the engagement speed that I select to, to activate hill descent control. I have the use of hill descent control up to about 17 miles an hour. After that, it, it will not work. Uh, so I'm gonna go down, I want it down at the very bottom, so I'm gonna use my cruise control settings, use the negative, negative button to bring it down. I verify that it's down at the very bottom, which is gonna be about two miles an hour. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna maintain good control of my steering, hands, ten, and two, thumbs on the face of the wheel, and I'm gonna take both feet off the pedals, I'm gonna put them flat on the floor, and I'm just gonna steer the trail. I'm gonna stay away from those roots on the right so side. That's because you have the driver assist. Initiative. Hill descent control. I have hill descent, hill descent control. Descent. That monitors the speed of the wheels. Yeah, I've got that in mind. Oh, it's great. I wish I had it in my old Toyota truck. So here I am at two miles an hour, both feet flat on the floor. And if a wheel is going to slip, one wheel or more, it will only break the, system, the wheel that is going faster than the target speed set in the program. So we can't do that. We step on the brake, we have to lock up all four wheels. We don't want to do that. Because if we slide, we lose control, we lose control. Who takes over, Jackson? Gravity. That's right. Gravity never loses. So in a cross axle situation like these little moguls are gonna give us, we don't want to go over so fast that we crush the suspension when the wheel comes down and maybe hits a rock or something. So we're going to make sure that our wheels are straight up this trail so we don't have to turn our wheels side to side, possibly losing traction, especially in wet weather. But we also don't wanna go so fast that we crush the suspension by the momentum coming down too fast. So I just keep the steering wheel straight and continue on the way. I go as far as I can until I know I actually have to make the turn. When I get to the point where I actually have to make the turn, then I'll make, depending on the weather, but generally I'll make small incremental turns. I don't want to get to the apex of the turn and then just crank the wheel in an exaggerated way because especially in mud or wet weather, it may, the vehicle may not go where you think it's going to go by turning the steering wheel. If it was raining, I'd stay low on the hill, of course, so that you don't have a chance, more of a chance, I should say, of gravity breaking your traction. But I like to go high just because it's more fun. So I'm climbing a hill, so I go back into drive. And I see up ahead there's another hill coming up. So before gravity can actually take over the vehicle, I'm going to go back into first gear manual. Because if I don't know the hill and I just come over and maybe it's a long, slippery, dangerous hill and I'm dodging trees and rocks, I've forgotten to go into uh, first gear manual. Manual keeps me from from the car from shifting up. So if I'm going down a steep hill, gravity's pulling harder on me, it may speed up the vehicle, and I may be dodging trees and not thinking about the increase in the automatic side of the transmission to second gear, third gear, fourth gear, I could have a runaway vehicle. Huh. So if I'm in the manual side of the transmission, I'm in control. I can shift up by paddling up to second gear if I wanna go a little faster. If not, I know I'm not going to have a runaway vehicle. But the same thing here on any hill that I know is smooth enough that it's not going to compress the suspension and scoop up dirt if I go two miles an hour, then I can use hill descent control. If the hill is too bad, too much problems, want to go slower than two miles an hour, I'm going to use my brake. Start on my brake and not build up speed to two miles an hour. So I check, make sure my uh, low range is still engaged, hill descent control is good. And taking both my feet off the pedals is strictly a teaching technique for people that are not used to it. So that if we get to a very steep hill and it's imperative that you do not step on the brake, you're already used to it and you know that the car will handle it. All this noise right now is just wheels slipping, ABS brake pump working, hill descent control is doing its job. Now I do come back on the brake when I go into this big hole because I don't want my front right wheel to drop so quick and so fast that it crushes the suspension, maybe hitting the edge of this uh, berm on my left A-arm maybe doing damage to the right. So now my right wheel is coming down to the ground, my left rear wheel is up in the air. This is cool, you got an inclinometer in your vehicle and you can show people how much they're leaning. 
which is fascinating. So now we're only you need to know how deep this mud is over here. And yeah, when you're on your own, you're gonna get out. Whether it's especially if it's <laughs> no, water, I know it's pretty amazing though that this car is doing this. So That's... we're only at uh, we're only at uh, 18 degrees now. People say to me, "Well, Phil, when's it gonna roll over?" It's the pucker factor. And I say, "I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know." <laughs> I mean, if you've got a rack like on your car. And you're out yeah. in the bush you and load you've it got up. load it up. What does it do to your center uh, of gravity? Yeah, it's going to raise it up. That's right. But if you've got three sumo wrestlers sitting in the back seat, you know, <laughs> you lowered your center of gravity and you'll be better off. 